早上有遇到吗？现在的有Okay, so we have uh, two more things we want to share with you, and actually in between the two I will show you something else. Uh, the first one is uh, uh, the transformer, and the other one is uh, the tool for uh, uh, the handling of uh, thermal behavior of the machine. And in between I will show you the uh, user subroutine as it is right now. It's not, it's going to be just a demo, so it's not part of your uh, of your printout, but uh, I will show you a demo on the Groovy subroutine and how to apply it on something special. So let's let's uh, let's talk about uh, some uh, transformer and what we can do with flux uh, in general. So of course there are different type of uh, transformers: single phase, three phase, auto transformer, reactors, anything you want to say. So let's call it coils and transformer, or reactors and transformers, and. Um, uh, we want to uh, design uh, or try to understand those machines. We need to evaluate losses, the efficiency, behavior, uh, saturation, uh, any type of uh, things like this. Even uh, we need to also uh, protect them. And uh, so the uh, classical uh, simulation test we're going to do is actually no log, short circuit in restaurant, but we will also be able to do any power factor we are interested in, just uh, by uh, uh, putting a load on, the, on the, the secondary and seeing how it works. Uh, in, fact, in fact, you could actually take a transformer and you could bring it in the middle of Fortunus instead of having the equivalent model of a transformer, just as the right transformer, and then see how you can uh, maybe uh, uh, how it would behave uh, uh, if you have a failure on the secondary side and how it would uh, reflect it to the primary side. So analyzing what, what kind of analysis we're going to do, iron losses, tray losses, true losses, but also magnetizing reactants and we're going to try to find the equivalent circuit uh, parameters for the, uh, for the transformers. <coughs> The other interesting thing is to do uh, thermal or mechanical. Um, maybe some uh, transformer, maybe uh, the coil vibrates or things like this. Or you're uh, mechanically you're interested in uh, seeing what's happening if a coil has a very strong force applied to it. And so those one, most of the time we do through third-party tools. Why? Well, it's because if we do the thermal.
example of a transformer, uh, usually, or not usually, but uh, often you have oil field transformers, and so you will have convective motion inside the tank, and flux doesn't know, it's not a CFD tool, it's only uh, straight thermal, so for what flux is concerned, if we were doing a thermal, we would probably stop just on the, on the surface of all the components and just put a convection or radiation coefficient to actually set the losses. Uh, other tools are much better, uh, Fluent, uh, Star CCM, and other types like this. So that's why we would go through third party physics, multi physics tools. And if you remember, Vincent uh, showed you this morning that uh, for the next version, version 12, we will have this connection that exists, so we'll be able to extend to all of those things. Uh, for the vibration, you can already start using LMS, uh, LMS Virtual uh, Lab, as uh, that is not limited to rotating motion type of tools. Here we have uh, some references, and in fact we also have a reference uh, in Taiwan, and uh, we have one of the representatives of the company right here, Shilin Transformers. So the geometry, well, uh, that's another big issue, is that okay, yeah, for, for small, and, and by the way I didn't talk about the power that you can do from high power to low power, uh, any type of transfer. We also do, I'll show you something that goes for high frequency uh, in a little, uh, a little later, but uh, the geometry is not very easy all the time, so if you take a, just a small transfer, maybe uh, uh, it's, it's just going to be a very basic type of geometry. But uh, a big machine like this, well, uh, most of the time you have a CAD system, and so this is how we're going to, uh, uh, we, we're not going to enter it directly, but we'll try to import it, and, uh, because it's going to be much easier. So, by the way, when you import, then you have other issues, because there are a lot of things on this uh, transformer, for example, that are here, maybe for mechanical reason, for connection reason or stuff like this that may not have an effect on the solution we want to do. The leads sometimes you cannot ignore them because they may create a distortion in the field locally, uh, but most of the time we'll try to ignore them. Here we have those uh, big, uh, uh, we have those, those screws or uh, whatever goes from one side to the other. Uh, those one, well, I think sometimes we just are going to describe them as part of the material, like your regular materials, more than anything else. But uh, there may be some corners, uh, I'm not too sure, some, some funny things happening, and those ones we definitely don't want to import them because this is going to create us a very complicated geometry to mesh, but sometimes we cannot avoid to do it. But the other thing is uh, we can uh, do full or reduced model, and because most of the time we're going to work in 3D. And for example, this one is shown in 2D, but uh, this, is, uh, this is kind of a transformer, you can adjust the air gap, that's, uh, whatever you want to call it, it's more a reactor, power reactor, or something like this. Um, it's, it's shown in 2D, but actually this machine should more be in 3D, because uh, we will have, uh, you know, it's not so thick, and then where you have air gap or things like this, you will have uh, some leakage. And the slickage is going to be uh, uh, to be uh, fringing, you know, fringing on the on the third dimension, and this fringing is uh, going to be very very important. And uh, so in 2D we would not be able to capture it. But so very often uh, we have to actually go 3D. Obviously, if we do something like this, uh, you can see all the clamps on the, on the side. You may have fish plates and stuff like this. Uh, those are not you cannot show them in in 2D and we're going to look at losses inside there. Uh, 2D, that would not appear because we would cut it right in the middle and we would, have, would not have those very important features, okay? So it's going to be 3D, but then think about the number of elements you're going to have, and so as much as we can, we're going to try to work on the fraction of the machine. So here we just work on one-fourth of the transformers. We have, uh, we can see the core, the primary and secondary, and then we have all the, uh, uh, the tanks that close the whole stuff. Uh, we're going to do the study inside the steady state AC. So the difference between steady state and transient, sometimes we cannot go to transient. 
if we are very interested in harmonic, uh, harmonic uh, effects or things like this, or saturation, if we want very, very, very accurate uh, saturation, uh, sometimes we have no choice but to go to transient magnetic. Steady state AC will assume that all the signal is sinusoidal. But if you really think about it, if you are in transient in uh, in nonlinear, the flux density variation is not transient, it's not uh, sinusoidal anymore. It's an ellipse, so it, it's not going to work so much. So we can do it still works uh, because when we try to approximate energy or things like this, we'll be able to actually uh, do a very good computation. But if we're looking at the local variation of the flux density through the through the uh, cycle. Uh, then uh, a very accurate description can only be taken in uh, transient magnetic. So the test, uh, again, short circuit, open circuit rated condition, as I said, it's for a single frequency. Sometimes you could actually work on harmonics uh, by building more of the signal and working with the fact that you can set a saturation in a certain way uh, uh, in the transformer before you apply a higher harmonic, but uh, it's not very recommended. <coughs> so this one is going to be the full signal, really. And in fact, the one I'm going to show you, I need to do transient because the signal is not at all sinusoidal. And then uh, steady state thermal, okay, for the thermal behavior. Remember, this is without any losses to fluid. It's just one that stopped at the border of the transformer, nothing else. So a little example of a transformer, courtesy of WTC, I don't remember what this chance stands for, do you remember? No. no. Um, it's a company actually in Australia. In Australia yes. uh, 150 MVA transformer, 132 kV, 14.1 kV. This is the flux model. So here we can see a few features there. Uh, the clamps, we have actually some other type of fairs on the side. This is chance, maybe on the side, uh, to try to mitigate the flux leakage into the, uh, into the, uh, the, the tank and try to limit the, the, the losses inside the tank. Uh, so those uh, shent would be there. Uh, we see here in this case, in this very particular case, we had actually some connections that were there also. Electric circuit is very easy. Yeah. We have a primary where we have all the voltage sources the primary coil, and then we have a secondary where we have the uh, uh, low voltage and all the, uh, the load. Okay? So in this case, it's just a resistive load, uh, no power factor or anything like this. So again, here we have the core, the shunt, they're all laminated. Uh, in this case, they will be non conductive, they're part of volume region. Uh, if you look at it again, those are the shunt lamination, the green part in the middle. So all of this is laminated. Uh, so there will be only a mu, and I, uh, I don't know why it says here, it's a mu, uh, anyway. Uh, the tank frame, or the, uh, it's the tank itself. Uh, what we're going to say is that the tank is small enough that we do not have to compute the eddy current inside. Well, that means that the thickness of the tank would be larger than the skin depth inside the tank, okay? which for a magnetic material can actually be very easy to do. So we are going to use a different type of formulation. It means we're not going to mesh the volume, but we're only going to mix the surface, and we'll have a surface impedance formulation on the face. So there will be a mu and a resistivity. Uh, then we have uh, the clamps actually, thin uh, sheet thickness, so set IP, Actually, those ones are very thin uh, in this case, so the skin depth is uh, smaller, uh, is, uh, the skin depth is larger than the thickness of the, of the plate here. And so in this case, we have another type of formulation. Uh, we can still put a face, and uh, it's, it's just a different formulation where we compute the, uh, uh, the distribution of the eddy current through the thickness, but from the face. And, uh, Lots of other conductive parts, so solid conductor volume regions, uh, conductive parts, so those would be actually maybe the connection in the back and things like this. And then winding bus bars, current sources, no any current, this is just a regular coil with a number of turns. 
Uh, I brought us here something we can do. This comes a little uh, in the middle, but I guess you, we talked about it this morning, so I will not go very far. Uh, the point here is that we can actually, um, it's laminated. So if we were going to do every lamination, it would not be possible to mesh and do anything. But what we can do is we can still take into, uh, into account the fact that it's laminated. See here, this is laminated with an air gap. But instead of doing all of this, we'll take one single one, and then we are going to mesh all of this, and we'll apply a special type of material property, laminated properties. And the program is going to compute the, uh, uh, the, the mu, uh, the permeability, cross-lamination, from the characteristic of the material, the thickness of the lamination, and the stacking factor. So the stacking factor will give actually uh, information on the size of the air gap between the lamination. So that's actually applicable. It's applicable uh, just in regular transformer sheet like this. But if for some reason you had a core which is laminated this way, why not? I don't know. Uh, you could also do it. So going back to the description of uh, my uh, material from before, we have non-mesh coils uh, for the uh, high voltage and low voltage. Uh, so that's a different type of coils we can have. We don't really care at this point. If we were interested in uh, eddy current or proximity effect computation or eddy current in the coil, then we will have to actually mesh the whole, uh, the whole coil. However, this is coming very soon, actually. Uh, uh, so, no, actually, this is a mesh coil without any losses, so it doesn't really matter. But if we have with every losses, then uh, we will uh, we will have to do all of this to actually do the whole computation. Okay, here is the model of the transformer, and so now what we are interested in uh, computing are all those uh, impedances. Uh, in different ways. So we'll see how we can actually look at those. And just uh, give you the uh, information about so the primary magnetizing inductance, the uh, secondary magnetizing inductance, the leakage on both sides, and of course the losses. Uh, that's just regular losses of the stuff. Um, actually, this show you something that uh, it's this. Uh, this information is not on the real, uh, on the same type of transformer. It's another one. I'll come back to this big transformer after. But let me just show you this because I think it's an interesting uh, example. So this is um, a kind of a funky type of things. Uh, we have uh, a core here. We can adjust the air gap uh, in it because uh, uh, that is going to help me uh, play on the inductance of the coil and things like this. We have a primary. The primary is made of those many uh, turns here, and we have a secondary, which is a big uh, sheet of aluminum. Okay, and here we have actually two phase, so we can get one or the other in this case. Uh, let's see, if we are, I look at the circuit, here is the circuit. So you can see every single turn of what I showed. So there is one first on the top, one series on the second, on the, on the lower part of the secondary. Here is a secondary, which is also made of a solid sheet, and on it we have actually a, a resistor. And then we have a voltage source, and in this case what we're going to do is only power the top part of the circuit, and then we'll keep the secondary part uh, as a closed loop, and we will see if there is crosstalk between the top and the bottom. So we have those... Uh, Resistor here only to measure the uh, voltage of those things. Uh, if I look at it, this is the source, so I can actually look inside the uh, physics, by the way. Uh, look at the electric circuit, voltage source. Here we go. The voltage source is defined in a nice way here. It's using a trapezo trapezoidal periodical function. So it's basically uh, giving the uh, rest, rise time, uh, the constant part, the lower time, and then the constant part at the end. And it's periodical, so it means every time it finishes, it restarts. So here it's done, it's, we, it's all prepared for variable frequency. I have a, a parameters which is called frequency somewhere, we'll look at it after. 
And so now we can see, uh, so 1 over the frequency is actually the cycle, and it's actually giving you how much of the cycle uh, it, it actually works with. And uh, in fact, let's see this frequency parameter. Here it is. It's in the I/O parameters. Here we have frequency, and this is 1,000 1 kilohertz. Okay. So if I plot the signal, this is what I happen, what I get here. Okay, on the primary side. So let's look on the secondary side. So that's what I get on the. Um, this is what happens. The current. It's actually the current that goes through the primary. Okay. So it, it, why is it like this? It's because you have all the inductance that uh, uh, slow down the, race, the rise of the current. Then you have the switching and it goes the other side. Uh, so that's curve number two. Uh, curve number three, that's actually the current that goes inside. Ooh, wait a minute. Let me just make sure I'm looking at the right. Yeah, in the resistor. So it's the current that goes through the secondary. Actually. So it would be directly associated to the voltage, of course, because it's only current. And uh, the fourth one here is actually, this is the, uh, let's see, what do we have here? If I put them on top of each other, so this is the, um, this is the current through. We have the current through the voltage source. We have the current through the uh, primary which is opposite, it's just because we assume that the current is negative in a source basically. And then this is what we find the current in the uh, secondary. So what do we have here? We have, as I said before, everything here is, uh, everything here is, uh, uh, is uh, solid, okay? So now I can look at different things, of course, this is a flux density distribution. Uh, nothing special here, we can see it does actually go through, so we should actually see some uh, crosstalk eventually here. Uh, we have some saturation on the side. It's not a very saturated type of things, it's not a very high current, so there is no friction on the side. Uh, another thing we would like to see is eventually uh, the uh, uh, current density, and I think I'm actually uh, probably going to have trouble here, but let's try to see. I know, here we go. We have the current, so this is the current density in one of the coil here. I can put it in all the stuff. So the current, it's a current density. It's a current density because uh, uh, it's, it's not uniform because it's distributed. I have a solid conductor. And so we have a frequency here. And so at different uh, time, it's going to have a different value. So let's, uh, let's try to do this, uh, uh, this uh, picture here with all of these uh, primary coils. So I'm going to take current density. Uh, we'll just first do all the primary coil here first. Uh, so let's go uh, primary. So it's going to be 1, 2, 12. I don't know where. So I'll just take all the primary. Here we go. Not what I wanted. Go back to the top here. I should be able to select everything at once. Here we go. OK. So here we have everything. So the problem is at the bottom I have almost nothing. So I'm going to just move my scale towards the top and see how it's distributed inside here. And now you can see it's not quite uniform. You have a distribution. But uh, that's, uh, that's uh, you can see it's actually distributed as you go. So let's see now the um, uh, distribution inside uh, those two here. So let's. Uh, I want to identify them because I don't want to put all of them at the same time. Uh, let's look at the regions here, face region, and it's going to be part of the secondary, and my guess is that it's one and two. So we're going to do the same computation of those two. So here we go. Uh, let's do a new uh, plot here, new isovalues, and I'm going to go for the here. And J is okay. And now it's giving me uh, the distribution of the current in those also. So we have a higher distribution on the inside because this is where we have the core. Uh, we probably have a slightly lower flux on the uh, on the outside, not as much compression. This is why you have this distribution. So that's 
another type of transformer. It's not the one you find on the regular uh, power distribution uh, line, but uh, nevertheless, this is a type of tool that we can do. If we go higher frequency, we can also go to copper trace. Very often, those things are in 3D. This one was actually axisymmetric because it's only one single uh, core. But you could imagine to have a three, having a three-phase transformer in uh, this way. So let's go back to our problem here. And if you remember the, uh, the transformer we did and everything, uh, we're going to first do an open circuit condition. So it means we put a very high resistor here. So we'll have no current at all on uh, the secondary. And, uh, and uh, what we'll have is uh, basically the magnetizing current only on the primary. So out of there, we'll do uh, the magnetizing current. The core is going to be saturated. So that's going to be probably a good place to actually compute core losses. And, uh, but the leakage, we won't have the leakage here. So here is a picture. So as we said, the core is indeed saturated. Uh, every single leg, the corner here even part of the top. Uh, this gives you uh, the arrows of the flux density, so you can see that's for one phase, okay? This is done in AC, now we're going to look at one single phase. And we can look around through the stuff. So because we have, uh, that's, we can get some uh, joule losses here on the tank. I uh, will see it's probably not the most important part. We'll have uh, the losses of the tank in short circuit that are going to be much more important. The energy of the domain is going to give us a magnetizing reactance and the iron losses that we have in this case, it's 416 joules. Uh, so, out of there, this magnetic energy, we're going to actually create, compute the magnetizing reactance uh, for each side. Now we're going to do the short circuit, and in the short circuit, uh, we'll do a very small uh, resistance here. So what's going to happen here? There will be almost no, 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 uh, no uh, flux density distribution inside the core because we are short circuit and everything will be beside the two coils. Uh, so no magnetizing current in this case. The core is going to be non-saturated, low flux density, so forget about trying to compute any iron losses here. But on the other hand, we'll have a large leakage flux, so we'll be able to get the leakage reactance and we'll be able to compute the losses in the tank. Here is a short circuit, as you can see, nothing is here. Um, we have, uh, except of course in the middle of the core, but that's absolutely nothing. And then you can see the flux actually is not conducted anymore, but it actually goes all over the place. The losses, so the strain losses on the tank are actually almost 1.4 kilowatts. Uh, the energy of this domain here, 1024 joules will give us a leakage reactance. Uh, some other things we can get here, because this is where they are the most important, are the forces on the coil. Okay? And very important because if the coils are not well aligned, it can actually throw the coils out of the, of the place here. And then here we can, uh, well, we'll have a heavy uh, joule losses, of course, on the running in short circuit, but that's going to be the short circuit case, it's not the radio case. So here are the information. Uh, we get uh, the uh, reactive power here, uh, leakage reactance, uh, the dual losses, any kind of losses, well, in the winding. So that's actually would be using a formula based on the real magnetic induction that we would apply, and stray losses. Here we can see the losses inside the, the text. So all those arrows show you the current distribution inside the, inside the, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the tank. That's just to give you an idea of the current, uh, the eddy current losses inside the warning. So this is actually going to be programmed inside the software also. So we, you're, you're going to be able to get this kind of stuff. Uh, this is, uh, if I have uh, basically a coil which is made of many turns, I have the height A and we have the width B and then we have a pitch between the coils, I can actually compute the eddy current uh, losses from the radial and actual component of the flux. I'll let you go look at this, uh, uh, this uh, formula. It's actually, you can find it in the paper from 1988. It's a very old formulation.
uh, the uh, Laplace forces. So they will be computed uh, by uh, doing the J cross B on the coil. So if we have a volume on the coil, we can do an integral of uh, J cross B on the coil. Uh, there are two parts to it. There is a DC component and a double frequency component uh, that uh, superimposed. Here you have the different uh, information. Okay, let's even give you the orientation of those losses. Okay, uh, not losses, forces. I'm sorry. Eventually, we can bring the uh, thermal computation. So again, the thermal computation on the tank here. It's assuming that we are just doing convection losses on the inside and on the outside, okay? We don't have any oil going around, anything like this. What we put is we put a convection coefficient on the surface. That's all. Uh, just an example here, you have a computation that's a full tank, a little different. It's a tank with, which has a little notches and stuff like this. Uh, okay, I have a little more information here, so I'll go through this example. This is a transformer. Um, it's a power transformer. I'm trying to remember where it's from. Uh, well, I guess I don't have the information right here. It's, uh, it's one that was completely done here. Uh, it's uh, from our colleagues in Brazil. It's a Siemens. I think it's a Siemens transformer, actually. Uh, so here we have uh, the full tank here. Uh, there is a small air reactor on the side. We have the core, we have the clamps um, up and down. And really the uh, issue here is, you see how the wall of the transformer goes here? We have a little problem here because we have uh, stray losses that are right here. And they're hitting this wall in a dangerous way. So we need to find out how we're going to mitigate uh, those uh, losses. So. Here, that's just uh, telling you uh, how we computed all of those losses. Uh, and uh, what we are going to do is analyze those shields. So let's go forward. Uh, we did the 3D time harmonic simulation. And then uh, we actually did, uh, I do believe that uh, we have conducted that this is actually uh, uh, with uh, surface impedance and things like this. But let's actually go uh, to the uh, computation we done. We've done one with no shielding, so no mitigation, so the initial case. We've done a computation with a shield, which is made of aluminum. And then we've done another computation uh, with uh, the shent. So here, that's the first one, there's a shielding. Okay, that's, uh, I believe, the aluminum shielding. And this is the one with the shent, just to show you how it changes. The one with nothing, you saw it, it was before. So here is the external, the, uh, the circuit. This is the uh, input part. Uh, this is the, uh, so actually, yeah, this was even uh, coupled to the, uh, to the air core reactor. I mean, there were quite a few things that were happening in this stuff. But let's go further. This is the mesh. Uh, and let's look at the result. So this is the case uh, where there is no shield, nothing at all. And what we can see is that if we look at the leakage right there, uh, we have tangential component of the flux right here. So it's, it's probably absorbed by the wall and it's going to bring us a lot of losses. Now here is the same one with aluminum. Now what, what it did is it, it actually pushed the, uh, it pushed the field leakage a little further but obviously the aluminum is taking, the shield in aluminum is taking the most of it. So we may have actually a lot of losses inside here. And then let's do the last one. And in this case, we have the shent. And look how the, uh, the flux density has actually uh, gone down. And what's happening is that the, 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 uh, the flux is basically uh, channeled by the shent and nothing goes to the tank. So now if we go look at the result, this is the eddy current losses when we have uh, nothing to protect it. Then eddy current in the tank when we have the shielding. So you can see we don't see anything right there. We still have stuff on the, on the sides. And then this is the one with the shed. And look, we have absolutely nothing here. Uh, we have a little higher parts right at the top here, but it's very, very localized. 
and probably can be handled much better. And here is the picture at the end, once it's all done. Uh, they, this is the case, uh, let's see, this is, this is the final case. So basically what it shows you is behind the, the shunt, which is right here, we only have 62 degrees up there, it's behind the air core. And right there, which is right at the corner, if you, if you see the geometry right there, right at the corner, this is where we have the most, and it's very localized. Right there, we have two places with 104 uh, degree centigrade, but you can see that most of it is uh, just uh, in the vicinity of 60, 65 degrees. So it actually mitigates the problem quite well. I think uh, because we're getting close, I'm not going to go much further. Uh, this, is, uh, uh, this was uh, a case done on uh, proximity effect computation. I'm actually going to skip this one. And uh, let's uh, move to the next thing. So before I do MotorCAD, I really want to show you uh, the. Uh, I really want to show you uh, the uh, uh, the user subroutine and uh, how it's applied to some some uh, motors. So we're going back to the motor at this point. So I'm going to just close this. Go back. Uh, I'm just going to close completely the program, and I'm going to go back here to um, let's see. Right there, and we're going to work on the switch reference machine. This one here. So the way the switch reference machine is works is usually you have a very very high voltage to try to bring the current very fast, and then uh, the current is modulated so that you never exceed the maximum uh, current. So here is the machine here. Uh, this is, uh, let's see, what do we have? Eight, six phase. Okay, let's uh, look at it from the beginning here, directly, when it was started. Okay, I'll remove this. Here we go. So, what do we have here? We have uh, the different, this is the uh, lamination, lamination here. Uh, and then we have uh, right there the current, so the winding. If I look at the circuit, here it is. And as I said, we want to modulate the uh, current distribution. So we have a DC voltage. We have the different phases that are here. We have uh, switches that we turn on and off. And then we have diode to do a uh, free wheeling. So that uh, whenever we, we actually turn off uh, a switch, the energy can actually go out. It, does, it doesn't stay trapped inside the coil. So now, the, uh, the and then we have a DC link. We just have a capacitance here. Uh, the uh, interesting, the, what, what we want to do at this point is uh, to, uh, uh, to control the opening and closing of the switch. So let's uh, look at, uh, no, you know what? I want to close this and open the other one. Or I can do something else. Well, let's me delete the, all the project result. And I'll try to make sure I don't say save. Uh, so here is my circuit here. You've seen the mesh before. Let's see how all of this is controlled. So if I look at the switches here, the different switches, this is switch number one. Ah. So it's telling me the information on how, when the resistance, when it's closed, the resistance when it's off, and then it's controlled by a comment. And this comment has two parts. It has the part that is associated to the position, theta. And so it says that if it's between 6.5 degrees, so if the rotor is between 6.5 degree and 21.5 degree, and this is over, uh, theta is going to be always brought to the zero to uh, uh, 180 degrees uh, uh, cycle, then this, the current is supposed to work. But then I have another indicator here, and this indicator will turn on and off depending on the current. And so now I need to see how I'm going to control this indicator. So if I look at this here, and let's see, I'm going to try to get ready here. Uh, I want to have the three windows on the bottom. Here we go. So if I look at the switch here, 
So it's a switch, so it's not a switch, it's an indicator and it's part of a parameter. Here are the parameters. So parameters we have I1, 2, 3 and 4. Well, let's see those ones. Those are basically the value of the current. So I1, it measures the current in coil 1. Uh, I max and I mean, well, if I do an hysteretic current controller, I would have a maximum and a minimum. So I switch on and off between the maximum and the minimum. Then I have, uh, well, those things I don't really care. So S1, look what it is. S1 is done by a user subroutine. It's looking at the value of the current. So it's going to be absolute value of the current because it could be negative and positive. And we're going to do a comparison to a positive part. And then it looks at this, it gets the I max and the I min. And then there is a flag. This flag is actually to say uh, what it's supposed to do and things like this. So that's the initial call. So it's a user subroutine. Well, let's look at it. And if I'm here, uh, it says it's user. This is a function, but I can say edit function. And what happened when I say edit function? Well, look at this. It brought me this part. Let's just close this. And this here, it brought me this part. And this is my Groovy subroutine. So if we try, try to take a look at it, here is the subroutine. So there is this is just a header. Uh, this is uh, just some comment. So the, the, it's a Java connection. It's a Java programming, but maybe you can see some C part of it and things like this. I don't know. Uh, but there is some part that comes uh, from the Python or Java things. So really, we have actually uh, we import some part of the kernel. This is a part that we never change. So you see, in fact, that it says do not change this part. Here you can put your own import. Then you have classes. It brings some classes uh, in. I don't understand really what it is, but those are by default the headers. And then I'm starting my. Uh, I'm starting my, uh, my computation here. So I'm going to set up indicators. One, two, three, and four. Uh, they're static, it means they're being kept inside the, um, inside the, uh, uh, the, the subroutine. And then somewhere, where is the call? Well, actually, we saw the call. I called with uh, IMAX, I mean, and, uh, and an indicator. So right here. It's going to take the value of the current. Um, so it says I is the first uh, input values. Uh, I max is the second, the third, and the flag. And then, so that's going to give me I is the current of the coil. I man and I mix are the uh, hysteresis band. And the flag tells me if it's going up or down, basically. And so now I'm going to do all the treatment. Uh, it's, it just sets the value of the flag. So it's because I have different. Uh, Indicator one is uh, for the first switch, two is for the second switch, third is uh, this one, and fourth is this one. So I'm tuning all those different switch differently. And now here, what I will do is that it's going to look at the value of the current and see where it is compared to I max and I min, and then it's going to return a certain value whether it's supposed to be off or on. That's all. So if the output value is one, it means the 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 switch is closed. If it's zero, it means it's open. That's all. And it's right here. It's interpreted. I can do changes as I go along and stuff like this. But what will it get me? So I don't want to uh, sol solve it in front of you again. What I'll do is I'll just bring back the results. Apple blown. Here we go. And now doing this, I'm able to control the uh, switching. So first, uh, so that you know I have solved this, here we go. Uh, you can see the, uh, so in this case, for example, it's this leg which is being uh, uh, powered. Uh, here we can look at the flux line, of course, no problem. Oh, sorry, well, I guess I could be a little better than this. Here is the flux line. We can see all the stuff here. So let's look at some of the results. Uh, they're already here, so let me just not compute them again. This is the current in all of the coils. I'm going to put them all on top of each other. And, okay, this is the first one at the beginning. I have another one which is more com complete, but what you can see, uh, that looks like the color of this coil. Uh, let's see. Yeah, it's going to be too difficult. It's right under there, so I don't care. Uh, 
uh, let's look at this one now. No, no. Here we go. This is the current in all of the codes. I'll put them on top of each other. Absolutely. And now you can see that uh, I actually have the switching. So the phase, the first phase is on for all this time. Then it starts moving. It's on for this phase, the next one, and the next one, and the next one. And then this one comes back. So why is it shorter and shorter? It's because it's going faster and faster. This is a case where I have a couple blobs. And as it's going faster, the, uh, the control is going to follow at the same time. So realize that here, all of the control is done in flux. It's not done anywhere else but in flux. And if I do a little zoom here, uh, let's see, I'll do a zoom on some part of this here. So here it tells, it gives me uh, the information. Now the history span is between 175. So I go off because um, 100 is somewhere around here. It's, it needs to get up, you know, it's, it needs a sampling. The sampling is probably not close enough to actually get the right history as it's been. But, but you can see the normal, uh, the normal behavior of all of this. And if we look at the torque, uh, that's, I don't care about this one. Uh, that's the torque here. And so that gives me the torque and I can look, uh, I haven't done it, but uh, yes, I think I do have it here. This is the speed. At this point, I have not reached the, uh, uh, the, the, the speed that I want to do. So, I just wanted to share this with you because uh, I think this is one of the new possibilities. You can do this anywhere you want. So, again, I'm just going to uh, delete all the results of this one and show you something. Uh, say, delete this. If I want to do another type of, uh, of uh, user subroutine, so I can actually do it everywhere. If I enter materials, right there, I'm entering a new material, and inside here I have uh, users, user magnetic properties, and now I can actually define the user uh, uh, coefficient, and I can edit my, my routine. So I can do for anything, any variable, any current, if, even if I enter a variable, I can have this kind of stuff. It's one more possibility, like all the parameters and all of the things that you have access to. Okay? Okay, so much for flux. So we're getting to the last part here, which is the uh, back on schedule, which is the, uh, uh, the uh, management of uh, heat in, the, in machines. So the, uh, the idea is that uh, today there are a lot of things, there are CFDs uh, to do computation on one side. CFDs that are very, very uh, complex to use. They require a lot of training. They require also a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, computing power and a lot, a lot of time to get results. Uh, of course, there are cases where you cannot go past the CFDs. I mean, in, if we do the cooling of a transformer, it's probably uh, difficult to work without a CFD to actually get the right solution. Uh, if, you have, uh, uh, if you want to look very precisely at the temperature distribution in a machine, you're not going to be able to do this. So, and then, completely at the opposite of the CFD today, people have the, some back of the envelope computation. Uh, they look at the uh, average resistance uh, from the inside of the clock to the outside of the slot, get the number right there and try to actually get something very quickly. So the idea with uh, MotorCAD is that it's supposed to fit right in between. So it's not maybe as accurate as a CFD. It's not going to give you a distributed information or, or a, 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 an information computed locally, but it's going to give you a global image. So it will be able to give you temperature of the winding, temperature of the tooth, temperature of one element. And to do this, it tried to do it in a very, uh, uh, very, uh, uh, it's trying to do it in a very uh, easy way. Uh, it's going to just use templates, and out of this template, it's going to derive the uh, thermal circuit. So. Of course, when we do uh, motors, 
they will be, or if we do the thermal, we cannot limit ourselves to the 2D because we have losses at the end of the machine on both sides. So it's going to come from the radial section of the machines. Uh, here we see a, brush, a brushless machine with the housing and all of those things uh, where it will enter the, the different information. Then we have the actual part of the machine where we can see the uh, entrants and stuff like this, the uh, feedback control, mounting and stuff like this, the shaft that can be in a certain place. And as soon as it gets this information, it will be able to derivate this model into an electric, into a thermal circuit. So what it does is that it will compute all the resistance of all the parts, so resistance of a tooth, for example, resistance of a magnet, thermal, thermal resistance thermal resistance of the rotor, etc. then it's going to compute the gap between so the thermal capacitance to go from one place to the other and then it will take all the losses that uh, come from the operation of the machine and bring them in and immediately give you all the stuff so if I look at it, it's color coded by the way so yellow is the coil, red is the stator, blue is the frame uh, then uh, if I go the other way, we have the magnet, the, the, the back iron. Of